Am I live? I think I might be. Uh, from my friends, they've told me to give it like a few minutes to let YouTube catch up to where I am. So, hi everybody. I think we're going, we're good to go. Um, so this is my very first solo live show. Like I've never done a live show by myself. <laughs> so um, I'm excited. And today we are talking about wine because I'm actually a sommelier, I just got my certification. So this is a Clos Chapon Vouvray. And you're gonna see this little word, get the lighting set on it. Um, I'll go over what that means in a minute. But uh, yeah, I'm kind of obsessed with wine and I figured I would share some knowledge with everybody since uh, it's all I think about right now. <laughs> so let's just start off Shannon Blanc, everybody. Um, I don't know if everyone knows how to use a wine key, but I've realized recently that a lot of people don't. So just in case, um, on a wine key, you're going to see these two lips right here and right here, and they're both important. But um, yeah, so let's just talk a little bit about Chenin Blanc. So um, Chenin Blanc, it is a aromatic uh, white wine. Uh, the grape is um, it can be a bit temperamental at times if it wants to be, but in general, it's pretty easy to grow. It does like a bit of warm weather, but not too hot, not too cold. If it doesn't, basically, if it doesn't get warm enough, it won't ripen. So it needs enough heat, but if it gets too cold, um, especially, oh, hello, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Um, if it gets too cold, it's really like susceptible to, um, freezing and hail so you could really damage it easily it's a little basically the grapes are real tiny and they come in big bunches so anyway shannon block um it basically uh there's two places in the world where it is most commonly found the first is the Loire valley in france the second is in south africa surprisingly they grow a lot of shannon blanc over there too so back to wine keys since we're here um so the little corkscrew has a little point and the most common mistake I see people make is trying to get that point directly in the center of the cork, but the point is not in the center of the corkscrew. It's on the edge. So you want to go a little off center when you go in. Fun fact. So let's just screw this in all the way. And uh, remember how I mentioned there's just two lips on a wine key. So my top lip, you pull up, Go to the next little lip, comes out. But uh, anyway, yeah. So, oh, you know what? You don't need to have any any clues about alcohol. That's what I'm here for. I just want to have good times and like teach something about wine to people because I feel like a lot of people like wine, but they don't really know much about it. So that's why we're here. Um, so yeah, that's how you use a wine key. I've also realized recently a lot of people don't know how to use a wine key. Uh, Shannon Blanc. So yes, I was saying they grow in the Loire Valley. They are aromatic. They're pretty easy to grow. It's really popular. I kind of picked it for our first wine just because it's not really a difficult wine to understand. <laughs> it's just good for drinking. You know what I mean? So first things first, let's give it a sniff. Mm, okay. So I usually pick wines that are a Vouvray, which is a region, but it also is an appellation. So basically Vouvray grows so much Chenin Blanc that you don't have to call it a Chenin Blanc through Vouvray, you just call it a Vouvray, kind of like calling something a Bordeaux. Um, but anyway, Chenin Blanc, let's talk about this because I keep getting distracted by all the comments. So thank you guys for commenting. I really appreciate that. I've never been alone at a live show. What am I going to do with myself? So. This is Vouvray. This is from the Loire Valley in France. Personally, this is what I like the most. I uh, like, okay, South Africa is just a very different vibe for Chenin Blanc. Uh, in France, it's a cooler climate, so you're going to get a lot more of those um, green apple, yellow apple, pear, uh, honey kind of flavors. You're going to get a lot of those. When you go down to South Africa, though, you know, it still tastes like Chenin Blanc, but it has a different vibe. It's much more tropical. You get a lot more like, uh, like pineapple, banana a little bit in there. So it's just kind of depending what you're into. 
personally, I feel like ones from Vouvray in France are better, but to each their own. But um, this one is one of my favorites in particular. Also very affordable, like starter wine for Chenin Blanc. Uh, this is like, I think it's like 17 bucks. So it's very affordable, I feel. This one is really fun. It has a lot of great apple smell. It has a little bit of like minerality, I would say a little bit of honey. Um, sometimes there's really a floral note. I get a lot of honeysuckle in the, on the palate, in the nose. By the way, when you're sniffing wine, just stick your whole nose in the glass. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but you get the best way of smelling it. You get it all in their nose. So let's just have a taste. I don't know if everyone's drinking with me or if you're just here to like learn, but yeah, let's, let's have a taste. You don't have to do the slurpy thing. <laughs> it's just been beat into my head in Somalia school. So when you drink a Chenin Blanc, you're gonna get a lot of acidity. That's what you're gonna get first on the palate. That's that pucker sensation, make your mouth water sensation. So this is a fairly acidic wine, but it also has like a little bit of sweetness. So it kind of balances it out. It's not just like biting into a lemon. You get a lot of other flavors here. You get a lot of green apple. This one in particular is a bit more mineral heavy. I've had some that like literally just taste like a Granny Smith apple and those are great. And this one has a bit more honey, a bit more honeysuckle, a bit more of a floral note, maybe even like a dash of chamomile. I don't know how like intense we're gonna get into <laughs> discerning what flavors in here exactly are, but I get a lot of different things. And this one is one of my favorites. It's very affordable, easy going. Um, so like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we were talking about reading the label and there's this word on here, sec. So when you're finding wines, oftentimes you see the word sec or you see demi sec on a bottle and sec means dry. So it doesn't have a lot of sweetness. It doesn't have a lot of residual sugar in it. You're going to get a crisp wine that's like, it's perfect drinking on a hot day or whenever. I'm not judging. Drink whenever you want. <laughs> Drink it in winter, who cares? But if you get demi sec, that means semi dry or off dry, which means it has some residual sugars. It's going to be a bit sweeter. Um, it's not really a dessert wine. Like you can get this pretty sweet if you try hard, but I haven't really found a Chenin Blanc that's like super, super sweet. Uh, but yeah, from the Loire Valley in France, there's a lot of different varietals of it. Um, if you see the word Savonnier, <laughs> for example, that's like very fancy Chenin Blanc. <laughs> but like, we don't need to get that fancy, everybody. We're, we're fine. But uh, yeah, I think it's delightful. That's the best way I can describe Chenin Blanc in general. It's delightful. It's aromatic. It's got that crisp acidity. So like it makes your mouth water. And I feel like it's a fairly complex wine. You get a lot of different scents, a lot of different flavors in there. And yeah. I mean, I don't know if anyone tried one from South Africa before, like I have personally, I just feel like they tend to be a bit sweeter in general. It's because uh, it's a warmer climate, so the grapes get riper, they have more sugars. So it depends what you kind of like, I suppose. Um, there's other places that make it, like I think Australia is kind of getting into the Chenin Blanc game. They're making a little bit, but they're not really putting a lot of effort into it. So they're not there yet, but um, the ones that they have put out, those are like sugar. They just taste like candy. <laughs> so I think if you were like a really, really sweet wine, I would definitely go with Southern Hemisphere Chenin Blanc. If you want something more crisp, go Northern Hemisphere, go France. Uh, there are some in America, but like, like I said, they're also just not paying attention to Chenin Blanc. They're like Australia. The ones from California, I don't trust them. <laughs> I have not found a good one yet. Um, does anyone have any questions about Shannon Block before we get into the book talk for a minute? I was all over the place. I should have had like a more like thought out approach to how I was going to discuss this wine, but I'm winging it, guys. I just wanted to have vibes. <laughs> so, um, oh, you know what? Let's talk about similar wines in case you really like this one. Do you want to try other wines that are like it? Um, I would say... Probably the closest wine you're going to find to this is a Gruner Veltliner, which is from Austria. It's kind of, uh, I don't know. It's not like a Riesling. 
but it's more it's more like this because it has more of that acidity than a Riesling does. So I think a Gruner is very similar. Uh, food it pairs with, uh, I would pair this with Thai food. I think it'd be really, really great with like curry or um, side note, low key. This pairs amazingly <laughs> with spicy potato soft tacos from Taco Bell. I know that's not what you think of when you think of fine wine, but you know what? It, it blends so well <laughs> because it has like enough sweetness that it balances out that spicy note. And I think they go together fantastically. Let's go to the comments. Uh, let's see. Favorite type of wine? I don't necessarily have a favorite type. Right now, I just want to try everything. I have my favorites, but I don't necessarily have one favorite in particular. Uh, let's see. Uh, what made you go ahead and get certified? I actually work in the wine industry, so I just decided uh, I might as well learn some stuff. And I've always like, this has been like a wine and books channel for like a long time. <laughs> So I've just decided, you know, like, let's actually learn more about wine because before I never drank whites, I would like refuse. I'd be like, no, they're sweet. And there's really so much more to white wine than like I ever thought. So I'm very happy I did take the classes. They are a bit expensive. I guess depends which school you go to. I'm WSET certified, if anyone wants to know. <laughs> that is the Wine and Spirits Educational Trust. It's a international organization. They're centered in, uh, their, their headquarters are in London, England, and you can take their classes through different schools and then you get accredited by WSET. And after level two, which I passed, you get to be officially a Somali. You get to put it on like a business card that you're level two certified. Level one certified, it's like fun. I recommend taking it. If, you, if you're interested and you can find a WSET class in your area, they're in most major cities. But uh, basically, you get to try all the wines. That's what makes the classes so fun. So you, you try probably at least 15 wines in a day. Uh, level two, I drank probably over 50 wines. <laughs> so it gets a bit grueling at times. But it's really fun because you actually get to try everything out and see what the differences are. So I recommend trying to take the class. Mm. Wine subscriptions or wine of the month clubs. Um, I haven't, I love the idea, but the thing is, um, you get six wines for $30. I'm like, I don't think those are good wines. <laughs> if I'm just going to put it out there, um, for me in particular, I'm sure there are a lot of wines that are $10 or less that are fantastic. I have not found one yet. Personally, I think 15 bucks and up is like my lowest I'll go for wine. Uh, I just because you know you're getting what you pay for a bit. There is a certain markup in it, so you can find really good wines that are entry level, like fifteen dollars and up, that are fantastic. And you could find ones that are like three hundred dollars that taste like hot garbage. You know, it kind of depends on your palate. But um, those ones. Uh, also, here's the thing with wine: when shipping wine, so I work in the wine industry, um, wine can get damaged by both freezing and really hot temperatures. You really don't want to ship wine if it's below 30 degrees Fahrenheit or over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And I feel like a lot of these wine clubs ship no matter what. So they're just sending you boiled wine. <laughs> so I don't know. I haven't really tried them out, but I do love the idea. By the way, if somehow Bright Sellers ever wants to sponsor me, I love I love wine subscription boxes. <laughs> just throw that in there for future reference. Let's see usually find white wines either too sweet or too acidic. Can you talk about how to find whites that are neither? Okay, so um, I'll try to give you a recommendation first. And then like, honestly, what you have to do is just try a bunch of stuff and see what you like. Um, like this one, this is definitely an acidic wine. Um, it depends how much acid you like. So it's kind of hard to pick one. I would say a good medium wine across the board is probably Chardonnay. And I know Chardonnay has a bad rap. Everyone's like, ew, it tastes like butter. But like, no, it does not. <laughs> it tastes like butter because the winemaker chooses that. It is something that happens during the winemaking 
process and it is called malolactic conversion. We're not going to get into a whole chemistry lesson here, but basically that's what makes it taste like that buttery flavor. And you know what? You don't have to do that in your winemaking process. Some people really like that and they keep doing it. But you know what? If you don't, I would say try getting a like a Chardonnay. The ones from like France usually aren't mallow. The ones from California, definitely mallow. They're all kind of buttery. Um, yeah, so I would say try try like a, a Chardonnay from like the Burgundy area. You can find something very entry level that's good. It's crisp, but not too crisp. Um, look for the word Macon Village. Uh, there's several different companies that make it. Um, a good one is Joseph Druin, uh, D-R-O-U-H-I-N. Maybe I'll just write it in a comment so everyone can have like the spelling. Okay, so that'll pop up in the comments in a second. Joseph Druid Macon Village. Uh, it is a village level wine, so it's not like super fancy. It's not a premier crew. It's not a grand crew, but it's an entry level wine. It's probably like 15 to 16 bucks, and it's going to have, it's not going to be super sweet. It's not going to be super acidic. It's just going to kind of be very medium and mellow across the board. And I recommend that one. It has a lot of um, kind of citrusy notes, so it has like a lot of lemon a little bit of like green apple that kind of flavor because it's from a cooler climate you're going to get a lot more like citrusy flavors from cooler climates so i think that one might be good for you or anything that says macon village you might enjoy uh try these up i would want to now that it's cooler out i would feel less weird about them shipping because <laughs> during summer I'm like you're just gonna boil my wine like i can't i can't with that so Maybe I am interested. I always see like Bright Sellers sponsoring videos on YouTube and I'm like, oh, Bright Sellers, tell me more. I'm interested. <laughs> hmm. So any other questions about uh, white wine in particular? Um, what have I not talked about for Chen and Blanc? Um, oh, okay, you know what? Chen and Blanc, it is... Uh, it has that acidity. It has like that little bit of sweetness. Uh, they actually make a lot of sparkling wines out of it. Uh, usually they're called cremant. It's not champagne because they don't grow it in the champagne region, by the way. Sorry, it's fun. I don't know if everyone knows this, but for something to be called a champagne, it can only be grown in the champagne region of France. If it's not grown there, you're not drinking champagne. You're just drinking a sparkling wine. Uh, not that sparkling wine is bad. Like there's Prosecco, that's from Italy, so it's not a champagne. Cava from France, uh, not France, Spain. Cava from Spain is probably the closest in flavor profile to champagne you can get without being champagne. Uh, but Cremant is basically sparkling wine made from local grapes. So Chenin Blanc is used in a lot of Cremants because it has that acidity and the sweetness, so it, it takes bubbles very well. Uh, that's a new thing about that. Um, it's also susceptible to this thing called botrytis, which is gross, but go with me on this. I'll explain. <laughs> um, botrytis. It is basically the, the layman term, the common term is noble rot, which sounds disgusting, but it's not. Essentially, it is like a bacteria mold thing that grows on grapes, and it's called noble rot aka botrytis and people actually cultivate this on purpose because what it does to the grapes it shrivels them and it concentrates all those sugars and all of those sweet things and all of the flavors it concentrates them like a raisin you know what i mean so it sucks it all in and then when they make the wine out of it you get a really really sweet concentrated wine so botrytis loves chenin blanc because they have little really tiny grapes in big clusters. So it has lots of little spaces to get in and grow. So uh, you can you could try to cultivate the Botrytis in it and have a really sweet dessert wine. Like a lot of sweet dessert wines are made from Botrytis grapes. And maybe you don't know, but like personally for me, when I have a Botrytis wine, it is, um, I don't, there, there's a bit of a funk. You know, you're not super far off with this like blue cheese reference. It does not taste like blue cheese, mind you. It is, it's definitely, it's sugar sweet. It's so sweet. But 
there is like a funk note to it. So that's how I can tell this bin has botrytis in it. Um, yeah, so yeah. And also wines with botrytis tend to go really well with blue cheese. So I think you're onto something with that actually. <laughs> Hmm. So let's see, let's see. Oh, that's not the one I went to comment on. <laughs> has getting certified changed your taste in wines? It has. Honestly, just working in the wine industry because before, like I used to say, I, I, I was a wine, I thought I knew a lot about wine. And then I realized, oh, I don't know a lot about wine. So things change, you know, before I started working in wine and getting certified and learning so much about it, I was only red. I was like, no, I'm only gonna drink red. Whites are too sweet, la la la, you can't tell me nothing. <laughs> and then just expanding my palate and trying a bunch of whites, I realized like, oh no, you know what? They're not all sugar sweet. There's a lot of really fun, crisp ones. And I mean, do I still love red wine? Yeah, but even my taste in red wine has changed. Like I used to drink wines that like, I go back and taste them now and I'm like, oh, this is swill. <laughs> your palate changes over time like different things are like good to you at different points so um some of the the wines i used to drink like a long time ago i'm like mm, i don't like how they taste anymore like it's changed and now I, I appreciate different flavors essentially in the wine let's see any specific vineyards you tend to buy from well in general i am a french or italian wine kind of person even though I am an Italian American person, I just have to say like French, the French know what they're doing with wine. Okay. They just do. <laughs> and the thing with Italian wine, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of Italian wines, but it's also like a personality trait in Italians to be like, I'm going to make what I want. Suck it. <laughs> so yes. Are there laws and stuff saying you have to make this kind of wine for this region by law? And they're like, well, I don't want to do that. So screw you. I'll just make what I want and not say it's DOC. By the way, DOC, it's like, um, you might see AOC or DOC on a wine. That means it is from a protected region. So that region has laws. You could only grow this type of grape in this region. So like I was speaking about with Chenin Blanc, uh, lights, Bouvray. Bouvray is a place, not a grape, but Bouvray pretty much solely grows Chenin Blanc. So it is a protected area is an AOC. So basically you can call it a Bouvray and not have to say it's Chenin Blanc because it's assumed. And uh, in, in Italy, they're just like, I'm gonna make what I want. I don't care if you say I'm a DOC or not. <laughs> so not that that's bad, but it's just more like willy nilly and like France is very like regulated. So depends what you like. Um, I don't really have a lot of certain producers that I buy over others. Um, well, you know, there's some that I like in general, but I don't really have one that I would only buy from. Uh, for example, I really like this uh, producer called Trimbach, uh, T-R-I-M-B-A-C-H. And they sound like they're gonna be German wine, but they're not, they're French. They're from the Alsace region, which is Northern France, kind of getting close to Germany. So they do make a lot of Rieslings there. And they make a lot of Pinot Gris. They make a lot of different stuff. But the Alsace region is fantastic for wines, in my opinion, at least. So I've been really liking Trimbach recently. They make a lot of good stuff. Um, uh, like I was, I, I mentioned Joseph Druin earlier. And the winemaker for Joseph Druin is, is a woman. Her name is Veronique. And she also owns land over in um, Oregon. And surprisingly, Oregon is doing some cool stuff with wine right now, by the way. If you want some really, really dope American reds, try Oregon. They're doing some really good stuff. And Veronique, she has this land in Oregon. It's called Rose Rock, her vineyard there. It is fantastic for reds. Like um, if you want to try like a Pinot Noir, which is a great medium red, it's medium bodied, medium alcohol, medium tannin. <laughs> it's just very medium. So it goes with lots of different foods. The ones from Oregon in particular, and also the ones from Rose Rock are fantastic. So. I don't know. There's like certain regions I like and I go like explore producers from those regions, essentially. So I'm more of a, a regional snob, I guess. Hmm. So any more questions about wines? <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> oh no! Don't 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 boil yourself. <laughs> That's terrible. Well, um, I'm glad I'm interesting, but I'm sorry you boiled yourself. <laughs> uh, we can ask more questions about wine as we go. But um, so for this video, we can also talk about books. And I grabbed a bunch of spooky books that I thought were going to be fun to talk about since it's October. We're getting close to like spooky season officially. We're getting close to Halloween. So I grabbed a bunch of spooky kind of good books. Um, I also realized while picking these books out that I <laughs> have not read a lot of horror over the past year, but I have read books with spooky vibes. So this is going to be just like, vibes <laughs> so um first one i'm gonna pick for vibes of spookiness is the echo wife by sarah gailey mm. honestly this is making my best books of 2020 2021 when am i 2021 <laughs> it's gonna be my best books of the year list it's so good oh my gosh this is like frankenstein's monster the super feminist modern era there's like cloning and like murder. And it's very much like I've built a person. It's alive, Frankenstein type of stuff. And also it deals with a lot of um, feminism and how women are perceived in the STEM community. There's got a lot of different things going on here, but it's great for spooky vibes. If you want like a Frankenstein vibe, that's not just Victor Frankenstein walking around being like, I'm sad the whole time, which is what Frankenstein is, frankly. It's just, oh my gosh, Victor, we get it. You're a sad boy. Grow up. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Um, yes, this is, yeah, I have. <laughs> I go over to people's houses and, and like, here's the thing. Let's talk about wide storage for a minute because this is the one thing. Like, I'm pretty loosey-goosey when it comes to wine because I drink so many different things now I can put aside personal preference and just appreciate if it's a well-made wine or not however wine like I mentioned earlier it doesn't like being super hot or super cold so you want to keep it in a nice temperate location also it being in a lot of direct sunlight is so bad for it so like I recommend keeping it like in a closet in a cabinet you want it dark and cool, essentially, for wine. And I have people who leave it on their window seal, and they just bring it down. They're like, hey, want wine? I'm like, <laughs> I'm just, like, horrified because I know it's going to just be boiled and nasty. It's going to be so gross. <laughs> so, yes, don't leave it on your window sill. I've seen people do that, and I don't know why they do it. <laughs> so it's mainly just, like, I think if you're, like, handling your wine correctly, like, it's probably fine. But, like, yeah, if you handle it poorly. It's not going to taste good. Also for reds, people are like, oh, it's red wine. You can just drink it warm. No, you cannot. This is the hill I die on, okay? <laughs> red wine, yes, technically they say you can serve it at room temperature. But do you guys know what room temperature is in the wine world? Room temperature is 65 degrees or less. So it is chilled. Red wine should be chilled. You don't drink it warm. It tastes bad. Honestly, put it in your fridge for like half an hour to an hour before you drink it, it's gonna totally change your experience. The tannins aren't gonna be uh, so bitter. So the tannin is that, that mouth drying, bitter taste you get at the end of reds. If it's chilled, those things aren't gonna be as bothersome. So if you, you have a problem with that, chill it first. It'll change your life, I swear. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, echo wife. Oh no. You know, that's, that's okay. I, I really enjoyed it. But then again, I was like reading for vibes. So I was just like enjoying like the writing style, the turn of phrase, also like the whole genre of the story. Like I was in, I was, I was vibing with it. Are there plot holes? Yeah, you're probably right. Like I, I could think of some plot holes. <laughs> it just depends if it bothers you or not, I suppose. No, no, it's not. I got this right out of the fridge before I started filming. Put it in the fridge, not a sin at all. You don't want it super cold, like as long as you're not putting it in the freezer, you're good. Um, personally, what I'm gonna start drinking, I have it in the fridge. I take it out like 30 minutes or so before I open the bottle. 
So it gets a little bit of time to not be like so cold from the fridge, but it should be chilled. Wide in the fridge, not a sin. It's recommended, personally. Also, not personally, it's just in general. It's just recommended, I can say that. I'm not like a genius and I'm not probably the most expert person in the world, but I do have a piece of paper telling me I know stuff about wine. <laughs> so I don't wanna pretend like I know everything about wine. I just know some things about wine. Okay, another spooky book. Let's go. Uh, I just read this one recently, Final Girls by Riley Sager. This is a book everyone's been telling me to read for years and I bought it and it sat on my shelf for years. <laughs> I just didn't do it. So um, I finally read it. This is on my TBR list. You guys are getting the inside scoop before I film my wrap up video. Um, did I like it? Yeah, okay, here's the thing. I went on a journey with this book. Like I gave it four stars in the end because like how I think about wine, maybe it's not my personal flavor, but I understand that it's well made. <laughs> That's kind of how I felt with this book. I'm like, yeah, like I get why people like it and I get why it's good. So I got four stars, objectively speaking. Do I love it? It took me a while to get into it. Like there's certain things that are good, but like, oh boy, there's a lot going on here that just wasn't killing it. For a long time, there was no plot. These things were happening. And I was like, what is the goal here? Like there has to be like some driving factor to move the story along and there just wasn't. But like... Do I think it's like a good thriller? Yeah. Also, I'm sorry, I'm going to ruin thrillers for everybody, but like the killer, nine ten out of, times out of 10, it's the second person you meet. I'm sorry. Just take note who the second person is who's like introduced to the narrative. Take note. It's probably the killer. Uh, sorry, it's going to be the killer. <laughs> I mean, they throw out so many red herrings that they do make it a good twisty turny book. So you're like, oh, I wasn't expecting it. But you're like, mm, story format wise, like, yeah, I was expecting it. But I feel like he did enough work trying to like, you know, obfuscate the trail enough. Uh, I don't know. I liked it in the end. I didn't think it was fantastic, though. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> uh, hot, <laughs> hot signs, but hot, like, do you mean room temp? <laughs> Don't make hot wine. Um, that's so weird that people going to Walgreens for wine snobs. I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, like a lot of people love Riley Sager. Or Sager? Is it Sager? Sager. I, whatever his name is. Um, a lot of people really like it. I'm kind of like on the fence. Like I appreciate it, but like, is it my personal like vibe? Probably not. You know what? I am. I am Kim. I'm reading a lot of final girl books. Uh, I, I just wanted to have like this slasher movie vibe. I wanted a spooky vibe, and I decided slashers were the way to go. Let's see. The Blades and Bodice Rippers book of the month is, uh, ooh, what is it called? Uh, the Last Final Girl by Stephen Graham Jones. And this one is like a good one because it's like kind of novella length. It's really short. I recommend using the audiobook with it because it is an unusual format. It's not traditional narrative. It's definitely a unique format. So um, reading with the audiobook might help your enjoyment, but it's a short little book. I think the audiobook is like five hours long. Ew. Woo! Bless me. Um, <laughs> the audiobook's really short, so if you want me to like write before the live show, you probably have plenty of time to do it. Oh, um, I forget where, but I, I think it's just like, you know how books are formulas? Like a rom-com has a certain plot arc formula, and you can say the same thing about thrillers and any type of book. The general plot arc tends to be the same. What's different is how the author tells it. And for thrillers, um, it's just always like a person or murder mysteries. Like you watch CSI. Tell me how many times it's the second person, like every episode. <laughs> so a bit of personal observation, pers bit of just knowing like um, story structure stuff from college. I haven't read that one. But, uh, oh, should I spill the tea on this? Okay, I will. Um, <laughs> the publisher for the Final Goal Support Group, that was the, that's his latest book that came out, reached out to me and they're like, hey, 
do you want a copy? And I was like, yeah, I do. And then they ghosted me. <laughs> so I haven't read it. They said they were going to send me a copy and they never did. And then they refused to talk to me anymore. So hot tea on the, the books, the booktube world right there. <laughs> so no, I haven't read it yet. It does seem cool though, but I haven't read it. Oh, thank you for all the blessings. <laughs> It's my allergy season. I have uh, lots of blessings right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was. I'm like, why reach out in the first place? Like, I didn't I didn't ask for it. You guys emailed me. But that's just kind of how it is. Um, honestly, it's not even the first time, like, a publisher's done this. People don't talk about that on BookTube because sometimes publishers reach out, like, oh, do you want this? And they go, yeah. And then they just, like, forget they asked. Like, I mean, if I ask and they don't send it, that's, like, normal because, like, they get a lot of requests. Like, I get that. But I'm like, if you came to me, <laughs> like, mm, that's a weird, okay. No, because we had a whole email conversation about it. They asked for my address and, like, it was, like, a real address from, because I I used the company before. I think it was, who was putting that out? I have, I've been on other campaigns before, so that's how they had my email. So I knew it was coming from the right company. But like we had several emails before they just like <laughs> decided I, I'm not going to send this to you. They just didn't want to. I, I don't have a good reason. <laughs> they get a lot of emails and they just don't have time. I'm assuming. I think maybe that's what it is. I don't think it was like a personal thing. <laughs> it's just like they just didn't send it. But uh, funny enough, speaking of Grady Hendrix, hey, let's talk about this book, <laughs> another spooky book, The Southern Book Club's Glide, Guide to Slaying Vampires. Um, so this is, uh, it's kind of satire, kind of, I don't know, Grady Hendrix has this very distinctive writing style. So this is early 90s. It is in like a sleepy Southern town. And it's dealing with all these housewives. They're like, oh, we should make a book club. And they do. And then this guy moves to town and he's all real sketchy. And then like kids start going missing and they're like, oh my gosh, he's murdering kids. And they have a lot of evidence. But I think the real like horror factor of this book, you know, besides vampire and murder is gaslighting because all their husbands are pricks. <laughs> so it's like seeing like a suburban housewife trying to like fight off an evil vampire and there's a lot of like female friendship there's a lot of gore there are some scenes in here i'll give you a trigger warning for for sexual assault because there is a scene in here that i personally think is unnecessary but it's in there um but yeah i think it's really good i think it's one of the few books the blaze and bodice rippers book club has all liked we we have not had good luck with all liking the book at the same time but this one i think we all liked you know I don't think any of us loved it, but we think we all liked it. So I, I think it's a solid pick. It's got vampires. It's a good spooky book pick. Oh no, DNFing. Oh God, I haven't read Horror Store. I read uh, My Best Friend's Exorcism and did enjoy it. it it's like a very distinct flavor of writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair, fair point. <laughs> um, let's let's do one more spooky book for vibes. Um, this one I don't know if it's necessarily horror, but it's got spooky vibes, which is White Fox by Sarah Faring. So is this a horror book? No, but is it kind of horrific? Yeah. Um, you know what? Sarah Faring is one of those authors you either really love or you really hate, and I love her writing. Uh, she wrote Tenth Girl, which everyone either loves or hates. It's a very divisive book. This one in particular, I think is really fun. So um, you're following these two sisters and their mother was this like famous movie star. One day she disappears without trace. And like, like, uh, like 10 years go by. I forget how many years exactly. And they're trying to figure out what happened to their mom. And it's this whole like weird mystery. And apparently she wrote this very like, weird movie script before she like disappeared called white fox and it's very like hippy dippy darren aronofsky like weird <laughs> so she wrote that and they're trying to figure out what happened to her and that's kind of where it goes from there and it's these two sisters trying to unravel this mystery in a very spooky land and everyone has like 
alternate agendas and stuff. But I do think it's good for like spooky vibes if you're going for just a vibe of spookiness. Let's see. Mm. Mm. It's a fair assessment. I think Grady Hendrix does try to have a bit of satire in all of his books because, you know, my best friend's exorcism is like, can friendship beat the devil is like the main point of the book. And it's like, yeah, it's silly, you know? So I think if you go in expecting it, you might have had a better idea or not an idea, but just a better time with it. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, this one. Did you guys hear a phone ring? Cause like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm on my computer, but it's linked to my boyfriend's phone and all of a sudden the phone started ringing. I don't know if anyone heard it, but me, Never mind. If you didn't hear it, never mind. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I recommend Southern Book Club. It's good. There is trigger warning. So just uh, check them out if you need them. Um, hmm. Let's see, let's just keep talking about spooky books. If you guys have any questions, uh, wine or book related, please drop them in the comments and I will get to them. But let's keep going about spooky books. Yeah, okay, so Broken Girls by Simone St. James. Oh my word, this is amazing. If you guys have not read this, drop what you're doing and go read this. It is incredible. It's making my best books of 2021 list. I am obsessed with it. It's phenomenal. So, Broken Girls. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just very hot and I've been drinking a bit with no food in my stomach. So anyways, let's focus. I'm gonna rally. Uh, Broken Girls by Simone St. James. It is about these girls in the 1950s. And it also is about this woman who's a reporter in modern times. So it's a dual time period book. And they're both dealing with the same uh, location. So there's this old boarding school for girls. And essentially, it's like not a boarding school for like, well loved girls. It's kind of like, oh, we don't know what to do with you. We're just gonna stick you there kind of school. So it's that, and also there's a ghost, there's hauntings. Here's a good thing about Simone St. James. If you want actual ghosts in your books, she's bringing the real ghosts. It's not like metaphysical or metaphorical ghosts where you're like, oh, it's actually like a representation of my mental state. It's like, no, there's a fucking ghost. <laughs> and spooky shit is happening. So I really, really like that. I love that it deals a lot with like, like complicated female friendships, there's a dual murder mystery going on here. There's an actual ghost and there's two different time periods and they kind of intersect in weird places. And I loved it. It's so good. I'm obsessed with it. Please try to read this. It is phenomenal. I loved it intensely. Yes, please. It's so good. <laughs> it's one of those books I can't shut up about. Um, I have it. I put a bunch of my wish lists. I just haven't got to them yet. Um, cause she writes a lot of things about like early, like turn of the century, like mysticism and ghosts and stuff. So I'm like into that. I'm into that whole vibe. Let's see. Yes. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. It's so good. I would not have found out about her books without book of the month, honestly, because, um, the Sundown Motel was one of the books of the month and I read it and I liked it. So I was like, oh, they have this other book by Simone St. James. I'm going to get that too. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's even better. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just freaking out. I know, I know. You know, I'm having like two glasses. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I'm going to have something when I'm done with this. I just wasn't hungry in the morning. Yay. I am planning on it actually. Let's speak about that for a second. Um, I want to do more live shows for multiple reasons. One being, I just want to have wine tastings with people. Like, I don't know if you guys all went and bought the wine too, because like when I announce it, I leave a link in the description so you guys can try to buy it. Um, or just something similar. Or, hey, drink whatever you want. I'm not judging. Drink what you want. <laughs> so I think it's just kind of fun to like hang out with everybody and like have a glass of wine, talk about books. It's just like for vibes. It's a hangout. I'm enjoying myself. It's kind of like hanging out with everyone digitally. I'm having a good time. Mm. So there's that reason. You know, I'm obsessed with wine right now and I want to talk to people about it. Two, I can talk about books live. You get my like real time reactions because when I film, 
this is how I film too. Like I have never scripted a thing in my life. <laughs> I just say weird shit and cut it together. So now you're getting like the live version of that. And also, um, you know, it takes a lot of time editing videos. And when you do a live show, you don't have to edit it. So it's saving me time and it's going to be fun. And we all get to hang out together in live time. So I'm loving this idea, frankly. Um, also, so this is a Sunday and like, I was just looking at my YouTube analytics and it says like a lot of my like subscriber base is online during this time. That's why I picked it. But I was thinking about having a um, live show again, but maybe on a weeknight. Is anyone down for that? I was thinking maybe like a Wednesday, um, maybe the 27th of October, a Wednesday evening. I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles, so it would be Pacific time, probably like seven o'clock Pacific. I don't know if anyone's into that, but um, yeah, the phone rang. <laughs> the phone did ring. I, um, I told my boyfriend, to watch the phone, but um, did not. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yay, this is fun. Agreed. It is like a good way to get around COVID restrictions. Um, monster alien. Oh my. You know what? I have read a lot of paranormal romance over the years. So seeing people have sex with monsters is not unusual to me. <laughs> I think I only have a problem with it is like, okay, here's the thing. Like, I like werewolves. I love like a werewolf romance, but like, I will not stand for it if like he is in werewolf form whilst fucking. Like, no. If he is in human form, get it, girl or or boy or whoever. He, the, he she, or they, whoever is having the sex, <laughs> get it if you're both the humans. But if you're not, then I have problems maybe. Like, I don't know. And then like the alien series, like Ice Planet Barbarians, obviously this is not a human, but it's the human of that world. I don't know. Just, just read what you like. It's, it's a little bit of suspending disbelief. And I'm just like, you know what? They're enjoying themselves. Everything's consensual. There's no like animals involved. It's just, just, just bang it out. <laughs> I'm very laissez-faire about the whole thing, I suppose. Mm. I don't think I've read anything by Jennifer Mayen. So thank you for recommending. I've been enjoying premieres too. Um, I like to be able to talk to everybody. Um, Cause that was one thing I think I was missing from my channel was interaction outside of comments. So I've been like enjoying getting to chat with everybody on premieres and now we're gonna do some live shows. And my, this is my first live show by myself. I've never done a, like a solo live show. So it's like, I'm kind of just talking to no one. Well, I'm talking to all of you guys, but like no one is like having like sound words come back at me. So it's like, a, I'm getting used to it still. But I think the more I do it, the better it's going to be. Okay. Another werewolf fan. I'm into it. <laughs> I haven't read anything by Rachel Mills or Rochelle Mills. I haven't read anything, but like, I do love werewolves. Werewolves are the best. Comfortable. Oh, doing the live. Um, yeah, I'm feeling comfortable. Like I'm, I'm not, well, as comfortable as possible. I'm kind of don't know what to do yet with myself. Like how, wh when do I stop for comments? What do I do with my hands? <laughs> so I'm still trying to get the hang of things, but I'm like, I feel comfortable. I like talking with everybody. So it's like kind of just hanging out with people I already know. Cause I feel like I talk to you guys often enough. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Werewolves are the best. <laughs> They're the best, like, paranormal romance, like, love interest. I love it. We got a lot of werewolf fans in the house, and I'm into it. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, I got one more spooky book I can recommend. Ooh, okay. There's a lot. There's a lot. Um, some good ones I have enjoyed. I mean, there's the OG classics. You have, like, um... Cresley Cole, which I think is right behind me. Like Cresley Cole has a whole series, lots and lots and lots of werewolves. But Cresley Cole hasn't put out a book in several years. So I don't know. I'm not getting into like book drama and stuff because like I know there were some reasons why Cresley stopped writing, but I don't know the whole story. So I'm not even gonna pretend like I, I know what the story is. Um, 
Alona Andrews has some werewolf stuff that's good. Um, who else? Uh, like, I want to say Gina Showalter, but like early Gina Showalter because her early stuff is fantastic. Her stuff is coming out now. I'm not like so into. Um, there's so many. I can't like think of all of them off the top of my head. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. No one's read this. Like, I haven't met anyone else who's read this book. And it's a series, but like, it is so good. I am obsessed with it and no one reads it. I love it so much. And there's werewolves in it. So many werewolves and it's so good. Ceci Robson, if you guys haven't read anything by her. Spicy, but like, it takes a bit to be spicy. I don't think it's spicy in book one, but like it gets there and then it's like spicy, but the characters are so phenomenal. I love it. I love it. They have like, it's so funny and so like adorable. I love it all. Oh, hey, Alan, how are you? Yeah. Who doesn't like a spuddy werewolf book? Like everybody does. It's like ice cream. <laughs> everybody likes ice cream and everyone likes smutty werewolves. Um, so moving on from Smutty Werewolves for this a hot second. Let's take a break from that. Uh, let's talk about my last Smutty book I pulled. This is Mallory by Josh Mallerman. So this is the sequel to Bird Box. And here's the thing. I loved Bird Box. I thought it was phenomenal. Oh my gosh. It's one of those books I did and I read it all in one day and I stopped reading and I was like, oh, fuck, that was good. And so I was like, I had to read Mallory. I have to do it. And you know what? Is it as good as Bird Box? Mm, no, but there are some moments in here. Like I tab some stuff. Like I rarely, and by rarely, I mean almost never tab things. So if I tab something, I, there was something in there that was really good. And the thing with Josh Mallerman, like sometimes he writes something that's like, fuck. <laughs> so good. Like, is it the best review? Like, yeah. like it's it's fine. It's not as good as Bird Box. It, it, it's just not because it's like a weird story that I'm not super into. But like there's some writing in here that's just phenomenal. So like I do recommend it, especially if you like Bird Box, you know, get into that world again. Why not? Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, you know, there are mixed reviews because it's not as good as Bird Box. It's just not. I have not read The Diviners yet, but it is coming up soon. Um, I have a couple of books I'm going to be reading before it, but it is coming soon. Let me see. I'll tell you what I'm going to be reading next. Um, I don't think it was on my TBR, but I want to read it anyway, which is House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. I, I only have it as an ebook. I don't have it as like a, like a physical book. And then I have Bombshell by Sarah McLean. And then I was going to do Diviners. So it's coming out. I'll probably start it by the end of next week. So it, it's going to happen. Thank you for holding me accountable. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of good Josh Mallerman stuff. Like, if you want horror, like, I think he does some really, really good stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what? I usually get a lot more books from the library, but then, like, all the libraries in Los Angeles closed for COVID, so I stopped. But, like, I don't know. You can still kind of do it in ebooks too. They have the tab option, but it's not as fun. I like having paper tabs. Oh, it does not. It does not have smut. I'm sorry. I Maybe that was a weird transition. <laughs> Speaking of werewolf porn, look at Mallory. No, it has no, there's no smut in it at all. But uh, it is a spooky book, which is like my theme for today. Me too. I, I have heard good things. And honestly, I listened to chapter one already. I am very intrigued. I don't know what's going on yet, but I'm like, tell me more. I'm very fascinated by it. I'm loving it. It's technically YA, but it doesn't feel YA. So, so far, so good. I'm only one chapter in, but if I'm doing the chap, like try a chapter challenge, it's killing it. Yes, please read that right away. It's, it's phenomenal. Honestly, when did it come out? 2019? It was my favorite book of 2019. Like if I had to pick my favorite book, it was Sawtell Girls. It is phenomenal. I'm obsessed with it. It is so good. Please stop buying it. Go go read it immediately. Use your eyes to read it. <laughs> it's so good. Um, let's see. Let's see. So we're kind of getting close to the hour mark. I figured I would do this for an hour. This seems like a good round number. So I want to give you guys some time to discuss, I suppose, um, what we're going to drink next time. 
So right now I'm kind of scheduling it for the 27th, which is a Wednesday night. I'll let you guys know for sure when I pick it, but it's either going to be the 27th, which is a Wednesday, or it's going to be the 24th, which is a Sunday. I'm on the fence so far. So let me know if you have a preference in the comments or um, I don't know, whatever else you want to say in the comments, I suppose. But let's pick the wine for next time. I, I basically have a selection set out. So I want you guys to pick either red, white, or rosé. Red, white, or rosé, what are you guys feeling? Sound off in the chat. And that will be the book, not the book, the wine for next time. I want you guys to pick. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting. <laughs> Personally, I'm kind of feeling the red. Don't want to like hit like, you know, influence your vote, but I, I'm kind of feeling the red one. Oh, that was not the one I meant to pick. Lots of comments are coming in. Oh, oh, so many. Okay. So uh, Drunk Classics, the next book, The Phantom of the Opera. I think this is going to be phenomenal drunk. Is it just me? <laughs> I think it's going to be so dramatic that I'm going to be obsessed. I, I'm so excited to read this. I haven't started it yet. I was going to read some of it today, but um, it's my boyfriend's birthday this weekend. So we're having a couple of our, our vaccinated friends over for a little get together tonight. So I'm not going to have time to read it today. So I think next work, next weekend, I'm going to knock this out. And uh, I'm excited. It's pretty short. And it's going to be just so dramatic. I'm obsessed. So I think that's going to be a perfect drug classics pick. I'm, I'm really excited about it. So I got rosé, red, red, rosé, red, 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 rosé, uh, red. Okay, so I'm thinking red is winning so far. Um, I've never seen any adaptation either. I know everyone just gasped why have i not seen a, like an adaptation i have it. i was a theater major like what what is going on with my life i just never seen it even my boyfriend has seen it and i have it um i'm excited weird the weirder the better <laughs> um yeah so i'm glad you can join drunk classics so okay i think everyone's picking red i may have influenced that decision i'm sorry but like i'm feeling this red i really want to drink it <laughs> so for next time, we are going to be drinking this Beaujolais. I will put a link in the description down below so you guys can try to buy it if you want or just look for anything with the word Beaujolais on it. Um, so a little bit about Beaujolais. This is from France as well. I, I do like my French wines. And um, it's kind of from the Burgundy region. It's from just south of Burgundy in France. And uh, typically speaking, these are uh, Gamay based. And Gamay is a really good red for people who don't like reds, I would say. It is, um, it's, it has like a lot of really, really bright red fruit notes. So it has like pomegranate, cherry, uh, maybe even some raspberry kind of flavors in there. It's very juicy. It has like a floral note, which is similar to burgundy because there's a lot of floral notes and burgundy wine. This one kind of has like violet. It's a little bit of a violet smell in the nose. So it has a really pretty nose. It's gonna smell great. It's gonna taste great. It's also a red that's fairly, uh, it's much lighter in body than a lot of reds because it has like a very soft tannin structure. Like I was mentioning earlier, tannins are that bitter, like mouth drying sensation when you're drinking reds. This one, the tannins are much softer. So like if that you don't like that bitter taste, this one is probably gonna work for you well because it's gonna be softer. And uh, yeah, I really, I love, I like Gamay, okay? I'm just gonna say it. I really like Gamay in general. Not everyone loves it, but I, I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> mm. So this is gonna be it. Also got 91 points from Wine Spectator. So that's like, oh no. James Suckling, shit, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't read the sticker. I've only just found out. James Suckling is one, I feel like his palette and my palette are just like in sync. So when I see something rated by James Suckling, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna like it probably. Like usually stuff he likes, I tend to like. And this one, um, yeah, this is actually a really good one. It's, it's a little boozy, 
it says 14.5 by volume. And um, oh, you know what? I'm gonna tell you guys a fun fact. Alcohol by volume, when you see like, oh, it's 14.5% alcohol, kind of. Um, do you know that you're actually allowed to be within like a whole percentage point or sometimes more of the actual alcohol? <laughs> so this might be 14.5, it could be 15.5, it could be 13.5. <laughs> you're allowed to be off and just say it's 14.5. So take alcohol by volume with like a grain of salt. This is an estimate. Um, it's not usually 100% accurate. Uh, when you want to know how boozy something is when you drink it, it's that like warming sensation you get in your mouth. So like you kind of breathe out afterward. If you're like, wow, this is this fire coming out of my mouth. It feels really warm. That's probably a boozier wine. Uh, if you don't get that super warming sensation, it's probably really light on alcohol. Like uh, drinking this one, I have not checked the alcohol, the Chen and Blanc. I would say it's probably 12 to 13. It's not too boozy. 12.5, killing it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really proud of myself for guessing that correctly. <laughs> it's very light. I think uh, most wines kind of fall between 11 and 14%. That's like a good medium range for wine. If it's under 11, it's pretty sweet usually. Uh, if it's over 14, it's pretty boozy. But there's a lot of reds that kind of fall up, like over 14%. Uh, yeah, kind of. Because they're allowed to get away with it, so they do. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Uh, I, I work in wine now. So that's that's like fun. I get to try a lot of stuff. Um, I have this bottle I got from work like just the other day that I'm going to drink at my boyfriend's little get together tonight, mainly because it's a $120 bottle of wine I got for free from work. So, um, saving it for a special occasion. It is a Pomerol from Burgundy, not Burgundy, from Bordeaux. Uh, so, uh, Bordeaux wines, uh, there's a left bank and a right bank in Bordeaux. That's how the, the, geography is there's left bank and right bank when you say left bank you're talking about things that are very cabernet sauvignon heavy they have a lot of uh tannins are going to be really heavy if you're going right bank you're going to have more fruity stuff you're going to have more merlot based things uh because basically if you say oh this is a bordeaux you mean it's a blend there's no like pure thing from bordeaux there might be but i haven't found one they're usually blends so it's going to be merlot cabernet sauvignon uh cab franc petite bordeaux those are all the ones primarily cabernet sauvignon and merlot that's what you're going to have a blend of uh right bank stuff it's going to be more merlot heavy left bank you're going to have more cabernet heavy so if you're looking look for those um a pomerol is what i'm going to be drinking tonight it's like 120 dollar bottle of pomerol which is more merlot based and like a lot of people say, you can't taste the difference between Merlot and Cabernet. And I'm like, I can. I don't know about anyone else, but like I can. And the way I taste the difference is stupid because I'm like, okay, but Merlot tastes purple. <laughs> I can't explain it to anybody else. But when I drink Merlot, it tastes purple to me. Like, I don't know. The colors don't have flavors, but like it tastes like purple. And when I drink Cabernet Sauvignon, it doesn't taste like purple. That's how I can tell them apart. And like, that makes no sense to anybody. But um, so that's what we're gonna drink tonight for the party. And it's like, oh boy, it is, it is great. I mean, it's not the best Pomerol like representation I've ever found, but it's really good and it's expensive. So I'm like, oh, fancy party wine. <laughs> Apothic. Um, I have had Apothic in the past. I have not had it for several, several years. That is a, I believe Apothic, Mind you, I have done no research on this. I believe it is a California blend. So it's going to have, uh, it's probably going to be Bordeaux style because that's usually what grows best in California. So it's going to be Cabernet. It's going to have Merlot. Um, I don't trust the Pinot Noir from California, frankly, because they're they're very temperamental grape. They don't grow well in warm climates. So um, I'm going to say it's probably like a cab Merlot blend type of thing. I haven't had one in a lot of years though. So I don't know. I don't remember how it tastes really. Oh, you already asked that. I mean, I already put that up. Yep. 
I will tell my boyfriend happy birthday. He'll be excited. Yes, I will put that in the uh, description as soon as we're done with the live show. I'll put it in there. But in case you guys want to like take a screen cap or something or just write it down, uh, this is the one in particular I'm going to be drinking for the next show. It's a Beaujolais Village. I mentioned earlier the Village level. It's very good for like entry level wines. Um, I forget how much this is. I think this is like 14, which is like a steal. I don't know how they're making it this cheap. Like, I worry. But it's 91 points for James Suckling, so I feel, like, optimistic about it. But, um, yeah, like, I know they had picked these. Like, I don't know how they make it so cheap. I, I don't get it. Um, and here's a little thing on the back if you want to read some stuff about it. Like I said, it's hand-harvested. That's what I was thinking, because um, Beaujolais region. So this is Gamay, hand-harvested. Um, I think a lot of people who don't know about like viticulture in general, um, you think it'd be really great to have like a flat land full of like wine vineyards, like wine vines. And actually, no, like you want to grow vines for wine on a hill. And the thing is, the steeper the hill, the better. And you can't bring a tractor up a hill in most like industrial equipment to like pick the grapes for you. So you have literal people going, hiking up this mountain, picking like grapes by hand. And I don't know how they're selling this for like 14, 15 bucks. I don't know how they do it. What witchcraft is this? Because these are handpicked. Like, I don't know. Maybe I just got a sale. I'm not sure, but like, I am excited about that one quite a bit. I like MA. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Merlot is usually much like smoother it tastes purple like i don't know how to explain purple as a flavor but like that's what it tastes to me um okay so entry level and advanced wines biggest difference is price uh entry level it's going to be like 30 bucks or less which frankly is great uh you can get a lot of really great wines and they're for drinking for me, there's like two different kinds of wines. There's drinking wine and savoring wine. <laughs> drinking wine, you want to crack open the bottle, drink the whole thing with your friends, have a good time. You want to drink the whole thing. Savoring wine is like you want to like very carefully open the bottle, have a glass, drink it, enjoy it, savor it all night because it's very expensive. But like, is that the most fun you can have? Probably not. Like I want to crack open a bottle and drink the whole thing. So there's drinkers and there's savorers, savorers. <laughs> but um, personally, like if I'm just gonna drink a wine and have a good time, I just want like something that's affordable. I don't want something that, I don't want to be popping $120 bottles of wine all the time. Like I don't have this disposable income to throw away. So I want to drink like a 20 to $30 bottle because I feel like that's like, a nice price for like an okay bottle of wine, like a nice, like a nice bottle. Like you're like, oh, this is gonna be fun. This is gonna be a good expression of the grape, but it's not gonna like break the bank. You want something like just chill, you know what I mean? So, and then that's the biggest difference is mainly price. Um, and also, you know, winemaking techniques, where you get it from, there's like a whole other like conversation to have on that, but mainly price. Good for you. Savor your wine. Do what you like. No judgment. Wine is supposed to be like fun. You're supposed to enjoy it. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Like, I don't really understand like collectors who buy wine and never drink it. Like, did you just buy it to look at it? Like, buy wine to drink it. Wine is supposed to be enjoyed. That's my opinion personally. 13. Oh, are, oh the this one? Yeah, it's like 13, 14 bucks. And I was like, how? How did they do it? I have no idea. But like Total Wine is great. I, I much prefer Total Wine to Belmo. I'm sorry. I don't trust wines like, oh, buy one and you get the second one for a nickel. I'm like, I don't trust you. <laughs> wine should not be a nickel. <laughs> like, there you go. So I, I like Total Wine quite a bit. I think they have like nicer things. What wine is this? I am. I am intrigued. Um, tell me what why. Let, let me know in the comments. Uh, did anyone have any more questions about Chenin Blanc? Because this was our inaugural wine we were going to be talking about. Um, I talked about kind of regions for a minute. So this one, like I said, is a Vouvray. It's from France. Personally, I think Vouvray 
is the best expression of Chenin Blanc, but that's just my own opinion. Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out of South Africa right now. I think if you want to find an emerging market, that's the most exciting one. Uh, look for the any wine from like Stellenbosch, I think would be a good area to get it from because it has like a lot of sea breezes, but it still has that warm climate. So I think those ones would be good. Uh, in general, I think this is very usually complex. And this one is like a good one for your, this is a bang for your buck wine. This is like $17, I'd say. Um, and frankly, for like a wine like this, where it's crisp, it's acidic, you just want to drink it and have a nice time. You want to drink it young. There's no point aging it. You know what I mean? Like everyone's like, oh, it gets better with age. I'm like, this does not get better with age because it's like the things you like about this, like the really fruity taste, the really like acidic flavor, that's all going to get so mellow with age. It's not going to taste as good if it's older. You just want to drink it. Like, honestly, like um, 17 or later, 2017 or later, it's really good right now, I would say. So dr drink it young. If you're just going to like enjoy yourself, you don't need to age it. It's not that much. Let's see. <laughs> Wow. Okay. I don't know what I said that was close to toilet wine. So I'm like, an, I'm, a, I'm, I'm confused now. <laughs> please, please let me know. Yeah. Uh, sometimes there are like some winemakers when they make a wine um, and it didn't turn out really well. So they try to sell it to other winemakers as a blend wine, uh, especially like perhaps if it suffered from reduction, you might hear as a term going around. And reduction necessarily isn't a bad thing. It is, it's a bad thing if you didn't intend to do it. Um, if you did it on purpose, like there's a lot of wines from Burgundy that do reductive wine styles that make it really interesting. It has like a, a mineral texture, lemon peel. It makes it really complex. So reductive wine styles are good, but reduction, when it suffers from it, you're like, oh boy, this is unpleasant. Uh, reduction, the easiest way to know if a wine is reduction or suffering from it or reductive in winemaking style, when you smell it, like you give it a good swirl in your glass, you give it a good sniff, you would smell this like burnt match, burnt rubber kind of smell on top of the wine. And that's when you know it has reductive wine style. So sometimes it's on purpose and it makes the wine really interesting. Sometimes it's like, oh, we did not mean to do this. We're gonna sell it cheap to some people to make a blend with because it's not good on its own. So sometimes, yeah. Mm. In general, wines with um, super, super high acidity or wines with a lot of tannin tend to age well because like the acidity, if it's so much acidity or the tannins are super, super strong, with age, they mellow out. So you get a lot of different flavors coming out of that. You get like tertiary flavors. Like sometimes the people say like forest floor or like earthy kind of flavors, you get like a soil flavor, which sounds disgusting. But when you smell it, you're like, oh, like it smells a little like soil, but like in a good way. <laughs> It doesn't taste like potting soil, but it has a kind of soil like smell to it. So something that's super acidic, um, I would think Rieslings kind of age well if you're going for whites or um, if you're going for reds, something with a, like a lot of tannin. So like a Cabernet would probably age really well. Um, some some stuff from Burgundy age as well, but a lot of it's Pinot Noir. So I'm like, eh, you could probably drink it sooner rather than later kind of what what you like to taste personally oh okay oh okay you know what i bet this is moscato or muscats uh if you like sweet white wines moscato or muscats depending where you you buy it i'll put that in the comments you can see spellings hold on my keys are not working. Uh, Moscato or Muscat. Um, that is a very sweet white wine coming out of Italy. They make it sparkling, so you can get a, a Moscato Dosti. That is a 
kind of special wine. It's very sweet. It's like drinking juice. It's so sweet. So if you like it, good. That is a good entry level wine. I think you can get for like 15 bucks, maybe 11. Like if you get a good deal, great, buy it. Uh, personally, I find it a little too sweet for me, but uh, they do make a lot of sparkling wines out of it as well. So if you want a sparkling, get a Moscato Dosti. Some people really like it. So, okay, there is like a thing where people are like, oh, you need a different glass. And I'm like, mm, very rarely <laughs> do you really need a different glass. Technically, this is an Italian style glass, but it basically what you want is the top of your glass skittier than the bottom of your glass. You want it to be like a teardrop shape. So you see how the top of the glass is a little thinner than the bottom? That gives the wine plenty of space to be exposed to air so it gets some oxygen. And then the, the top of the bottle, top of the glass is thinner so you can put your nose in there. You get all of like the, the nose on it. So you want something a little thinner at the top, a little thicker at the bottom. Um, the only ones you really need to get like a really wide base, like a, uh, like a burgundy style glass uh, or wines that are particularly very old because they need to like have time to be exposed to air to really bring out those flavors. But if you're drinking young, like frankly, you know, if you're drinking just to enjoy the glass, you're just like popping a bottle, drinking with all your friends, it doesn't really matter. You can drink out of stemless, you know? Um, just in general, you want like a, a, the lip of your glass to be skinnier than the base of your glass. That's the whole idea. It's because it's for smell purposes and also for swirling purposes, it makes it a little easier, so. I mean, you know, drink what you like. Hmm. Try red wine. I don't, I don't understand how this operates. <laughs> I believe you that it exists. I've just never had a red dessert wine before. I think the closest red for dessert, because red usually does not go with desserts because it's so... It's not sweet enough, frankly. Uh, maybe an Amarone, but an Amarone should not be $11. If you find an Amarone for $11, put it back. They're lying to you. <laughs> the minimum you should pay for an Amarone is like 30 bucks. Minimum. Like, don't pay less than that for an Amarone. Uh, and that's basically, it's made from Corvina and... Uh, uh, Corvina is also what they use to make Valpiocella in Italy. And uh, when you get like nicer ones, like an Amarone, they make it using this appassiamento style. I'm getting very detailed right now, but um, in appassiamento, they basically dry out the grapes naturally. So it takes like 50 days, like five, zero, 50 days to like dry out the grapes and they get very concentrated. Like I was mentioning earlier with botrytis, they shrivel up like raisins. So like all the sugars and stuff get very concentrated and then they make the wine out of that. <laughs> so it's a very long winemaking process. If you're paying less than $30, I wouldn't trust it. But, oh man, an Amarone, it is great. It has like fig, it has like jammy kind of fruit flavors. It has like dark chocolate. Like it has like beautiful notes. I really like Amarone, but it's expensive. <laughs> Huh, I have not heard of that. Huh, for dessert? I am, I need to look that up because I don't, I, I, I don't know because usually reds are not for dessert, but I, I will look that up and see what's going on with that because that, it's, that's interesting to me. Any other questions before we start closing this out since it's like, we're kind of, we've gone past the hour mark. Um, I don't know. Um, Illinois, I'm not sure. I just kind of picked Total Wine because they're like all over the country, but they're not everywhere. Um, Illinois, they should. Illinois doesn't have any weird wine laws. There are certain states that it's difficult to ship wine to, like um, New York, Alabama. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Massachusetts, for example. Like, you can't ship wine there. But there's a lot of states that are like, nobody cares. Just ship all you want. <laughs> 
So Illinois, you should be able to ship there, but they might just not. Um, I would just recommend looking up whatever you got near you. Um, I don't know a lot of Midwest stores. Like I know stuff from Kentucky because that's where my boyfriend's from. So I've been to Kentucky wine stores, <laughs> which probably don't help you at all. Um, usually like I'll put in like a name and like if you can't get the exact wine, you can get something similar. So just look up the word Beaujolais in your zip code and maybe you should be able to find something. Uh, this one, I, or Gamay in general, but like Gamay, they grow it in multiple places. So if you want to get a Beaujolais Gamay, it's a different expression of the grape, essentially. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't know. Um, sometimes I know people aren't going to be able to get the exact same wines and I feel bummed about that. But you could get probably something similar just to like try it out. You know, and if you like it, you can try to find different different varieties. But this one is the one I'm going to be drinking in particular. Showing it on there. I'm going to put a, a link in the comments. Not the comments, the description. Any final questions before we start wrapping up? Okay. Well, I'm going to start wrapping up. If you got a question, toss it in and I'll, I'll answer it before we go. Uh, yes, thank you guys so much for joining in. I've had such a fun time just talking about wine. I'm not an expert, but I am certified. So like, I have a piece of paper saying I know stuff about wine, <laughs> essentially. But do I know everything about wine? Probably not. But thank you guys so much for coming. Like I was worried that no one was going to care. <laughs> so you guys came and you wanted to talk about wine with me. I really, really appreciate it from the bottom of my little black heart. <laughs> Um, let's see. I have to look it up because I, I am baffled by a red dessert wine. Like, I don't know what that's like. Um, so yeah, I'll have to look it up and see what that's, that's all about. Uh, yes. Thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate it so much. Again, also, yes, you have a great Sunday too. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. I appreciate all of you guys for showing up and wanting to talk about wine. And I'll see you guys soon. Uh, it's either going to be the 24th or the 27th. I don't have like a hundred percent knowledge of what I'm going to pick yet. Cause the 20, basically the 23rd, that Saturday is going to be my next drunk classics episode. So I'm like, do I want to do two videos in a weekend or do I want to wait till Wednesday? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if you guys want to do Wednesday, we could do it or we could just do it on a Sunday again. I don't know. Let me, let me know. Put in the comments what you prefer and I'll, it'll help me pick. So it's going to be the 24th and 27th. Those are the dates I'm trying to decide between right now. But like we have the wine picked. So like one out of two isn't bad, everybody. We're doing okay. <laughs> um, yes, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to do it again. And I'm excited to talk to everybody again. All right. Bye. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any recommendations or questions or what have you. And we'll get to it next time.